to have you guys here this evening. Take your Bibles, turn to Lamentations, the book of Lamentations. Be looking through this as we're going through, just looking at these books kind of each Wednesday night, uh, giving you sort of a highlight of uh, each of these books, trying to then make it applicable for our lives as well tonight. And we have a fill in the blank for you. If you didn't get one, they're on the back table there in the back of the church. If you do follow along, and it actually took me this long to come around to this, but I numbered mine too, so I can let you know now where exactly we are in case I get lost halfway through. So it be a little easier to follow along. First blank there for you is Sin Carries Heavy Consequences. Right, and you're going to see this in this book, right? This has really been uh, the judgment God was declaring uh, if his people would not repent. And now we see this coming to be. And sin carries heavy consequences. Look at just the first chapter of uh, Lamentations. And I want to read just the first three verses to kind of get us going tonight. This is, now doth the city sit solitary, or rather how, how doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How has she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces, now is she become tributary? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dwelt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction. Because of great servitude, she dwelleth among the heathen. She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. And really, what a lamentation that is, just those first three verses. Uh, one said it's a mute reminder that sin, this is number two for you, that sin, in spite of all its allurement and excitement, carries with it heavy weights of sorrow, grief, misery, barrenness, and pain. It is the other side of the eat, drink, and be merry coin. Right? And that's what sin is. It reminds us of these things, these heavy weights of sorrow. It brings grief. It brings misery. It brings pain. We're, as a nation, going through that today, right? We see these shootings. We see these killings. And this is a result of sin, right? People are hurting. People are grieving. There's misery. There's even this barrenness that was spoken here in this quote. There's just a sense of why do these things happen? Well, we know it's sin, right? They need a savior, one of the, as we look at our introduction tonight, the book of Lamentations is made up of five poems, each an expression of grief over the fall of Jerusalem. So that's what the book is in whole, right? There's these five chapters, these five poems, if you will, this expression of grief over the fall of Jerusalem. Like a eulogy at a funeral, these laments are intended to mourn a loss, in this case, it's not a loss of a person, rather it's a loss of a nation. Now they're in captivity. Number three is the latter half of chapter three implies that the purpose behind the book's graphic depictions of sorrow and suffering was to produce hope in the God whose compassion is new every morning. We see that in verse 23 of chapter three, and whose faithfulness is great even to a people who have been condemned to show their own unfaithfulness. So what's the purpose? It's to show this sorrow and suffering, to produce hope in God with compassion. The book consists of five melancholy poems, one for each chapter, of mourning over the terrible destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by Babylon. The first two chapters are written as acrostics. Each verse begins with a word whose first letter is successively one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. That's not just a thought. That's true, by the way. I looked at that because I don't know Hebrew. And uh, it's how it's laid out. And by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you see it follow that line. The literary form is alphabetical, somewhat like Psalm 119. In chapter 3, this is number 5 for you, there are 66 verses, 
arranged in 22 groups of three verses each, of which in succession begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, right? So it's not by accident, all right? This was inspired by God. There's a reason for this. There's emphasis on the way it was written, the way this acrostic was written. The poems are written in a cadence that would be used in funeral dirges. How many know what a dirge is? You're going to learn two new words tonight. If you don't know what that is, you know what that is? Is it a song? It's like sorrow, mourning. It is. Sadness. Right. So it's like a, it's a lament for the dead. That's what a dirge is at a funeral, right? That's what you use at a funeral. And that's what, how this is written. It's got that cadence that would be used in a funeral dirge. So remember that. Write that down. That's your word for the day. A crucial thought, number seven, is often overlooked, characteristic of the book of Lamentations as its relationship to Deuteronomy 28, right? We see that uh, uh, really weaving of these two together. The book of Lamentations was attempting to show the fulfillment of the curses presented in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And the number eight for you is all the heartaches and hardships experienced by Jerusalem in the book of Lamentations had been predicted about 900 years earlier by Moses. Right now we see this coming to be. Remember, if you turn your heart away from God, the nation will fall, right? If you turn your heart to wickedness, if you follow after false idols, all of those things, now they're seeing this judgment, these curses come to pass. God had warned of the fearful consequences of disobedience, and as Jeremiah carefully noted, God faithfully carried out those curses. Now, God's judgment is coming to be upon the people, and Jeremiah, through this book of Lamentations, is lamenting over it. I'm going to give you another word here. This was a quote by J. Vernon McGee. So you can hear his voice now in your head, right? And he can get going. So consider this. I'm going to, I'm going to spell the word. For, I'm going to use it in a sentence in a minute. But then, just so you know, it's spelled P-A-E-A-N. All right? Now it's pronounced, don't chuckle, it's pronounced peon. All right, that's how you pronounce it. Anybody know what that word means? You know? It's not, it's not, it's not a little dweeby guy, right? That's, huh? No, that's not, yeah, no, it's not. You know, it, what it is, a peon is a song of praise or triumph. Now, this is how J. U. Vernon McGee uses that. So when you hear the word, you think of a song of praise or triumph, he's going to use it in this phrase. The book is filled with tears and sorrows. It is a peon of pain, a poem of pity, a proverb of pathos, a hymn of heartbreak, a psalm of sadness, a sympathy of sorrow. It is a wailing wall of the Bible, right? So it's basically just, just it's a, a declaration of sorrow, if you will. That's what Joshua is doing in this book. We must see that sin carries heavy consequences. This is number nine. And that God's ways is always the best way. Right? We should apply that to our life tonight. We know that truth. Right? We talk about it all the time. We preach about it all the time. You've heard it a million times. But folks, we need to be reminded of this. Right? We go through these things in our country. We go through these things as believers, through testing, through trials, through tribulations. We need to be grounded in the fact that God's ways are always best. They're always right. doesn't matter what the world says. doesn't matter how they think or how they perceive things. It's that God's is always correct. And we should then in turn follow him, right? Sadly, you know, we, we, you have heard a lot of debate probably in the last 24 hours just of what's happened in our country. I haven't heard very much about biblical things. I've heard some people mention maybe the stain of sin or maybe some corrosion of wickedness in our country, but not one person has ever said, you know what we need to do? We need to get back to the fundamentals of the word of God. I haven't heard that at all. I don't know if you have. If you have, I'd like to hear what you're listening to other than, you know, preachers on the radio. But you notice they don't think that way because they're not trying to figure out God's way. They're trying to reason and rationalize and try to fix this by man's way. And we're going to fail every time if we do that. Sadly, they'll quote a little bit of scripture, right, for maybe comfort, but yet then they won't follow it when it comes to decisions how to run our country. God's ways are always the best ways. 
There are little, several important observations that we can make as we study this book, and we're going to look at some of this background now. Number 10, the title lamentation conveys the idea of loud cries, right? This is a lament. This is sorrowful. Jeremiah is just mourning the fact that now they're in judgment. Now his people, he's seen his countrymen, he's seen Jerusalem in uh, this captivity. The Hebrew for the word alas or the word how is used as an expression of dismay or lamentations. We started that in verse 1. So when you see that word alas or how, that's that expression of dismay. How doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations, the princes among the provinces? How is she become tributary? It's a wailing. It's a cry. Chapter 2, verse 1. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger? Just talking about God's judgment, right? We understood why God did it. Chapter 4, verse 1. How, I, I thought this was interesting. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. Right? Even the finest things, in essence, they're lamenting. They just don't have the same shimmer anymore. They don't have the same value. Why? Because they're in this captivity. The early rabbis began to call the book of loud cries or lamentations. That's where we get this title. Jeremiah 7, chapter 29 speaks of that. Cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away, and take up a lamentation on high places, for the Lord hath rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. Number 12 is, this is the only Old Testament book that totally laments. Right? Now, we do, we'll see a little bit here where like I said, there's that thought of uh, knowing God is in control and knowing he can deliver, but really this is a book of men's. It is uh, a distressful dirge, that word we used a moment ago. Number 13, the book teaches all believers how to deal with suffering. Right? We, what we learn here, what we should learn, knowing what has happened to them, knowing the history of this, knowing that sin has consequences, then what we should learn is how to do right, right? How to choose to then obey God, how to apply those principles to our life and not then fall into judgment because we've fallen into sin. I don't think any of us want that tonight. None of us want to drift away from God where judgment comes on our life. Well, then as we hear these biblical stories and we see these things laid out where God is faithful, even in his judgment, God declares, hey, if you don't turn back to me, you will be judged, right? You will be in captivity. And then as we see his long suffering, even in that, that degree of punishment, years and years went by, and yet they never turned their face back to God. And now finally they're in judgment. Now finally they're in captivity. And we see that come to be. God is faithful in what he tells us. We ought to take it for face value. The author is not named in the book. However, Jewish tradition points to Jeremiah as the author. Internal and historical evidences, as well as the census, points to Jeremiah as the writer. That's number 14 there for you. Jeremiah speaks of it in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 29. And then Jer Jeremiah already wrote uh, Lamentations for Joshua in 2 Chronicles chapter 35. I'll read that tonight. It says, And Jeremiah lamented for Joshua, and all the singing men and all the singing women spake of Joshua in their lamentations to this day, and made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the Lamentations. Right, so we accept that Jeremiah is the author. The author Jeremiah was an eyewitness to these things that we read even in chapter 1 and then throughout the rest of the book of well that was happening to these people. Number 15, the language used closely parallels that used by Jeremiah. In other words, it's just similarly written to him. Right, So we conclude it was him that wrote it. Number 16, tradition says, Jeremiah sat weeping outside Jerusalem's north wall under the knoll called Golgotha, where the Lord was later to die. 
What a picture that would, would, would have been, huh? Now here he is weeping over these folks right there where the Lord was later to die as well. Date was 586 B.C., either during or following Jerusalem's fall. Give you some background. Number 17, Joshua, 800 years earlier, spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem. We talked about that a minute ago. I want to look at that for you tonight. Joshua chapter 23, that way you just see scripture, uh, the truth in scripture. So Joshua 23, verse 15, we see this we'll say prophecy, if you will. Therefore it shall come to pass that as all good things are come upon you, which the Lord your God promised you, so shall the Lord bring upon you evil things until he have destroyed you from off this good land, which the Lord your God hath given you. When you have transgressed and... Uh, or rather, when you transgressed the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you and gave uh, and have gone and served other gods and bowed yourselves to them, then shall the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. You shall perish quickly from off the good land which he hath given unto you. Right, we see Joshua is giving this, uh, this warning, if you will, says, listen, you went after these false gods. You served after them. You bowed yourselves before them, knowing that there's only one true God. And he said, judgment will come. Judgment will come if you proceed down this path. And then we even see that's laid out clearly what will happen. This land will be taken from you. You'll perish in it. For over 40 years, Jeremiah, we talked about this, had prophesied of coming judgment and had been scorned. Remember, he was trying to get them to turn away from their sin and follow the one true God. We, we discussed that, right? He was faithful for 10 years and no one listened, no one repented. So he preached for another 10 years. Now he's 20 years into it and still no one. No one's listening, no one's repenting. They're still living in sin. They're still following after false gods. 30 years now go by, 40 years now go by and he's been declaring this judgment all of this time, pleading with these people, this weeping prophet, that they will repent. It's kind of what we do in our country today, right? Even though you don't have to be a preacher necessarily, but that's what we do. We are pleading with our country to turn its face back to God. Often I think we feel a lot like Jeremiah where they just don't listen, right? They're, they seem not to be listening. They seem to harden their hearts more and more every day. But yet our responsibility is to be like Jeremiah, to be faithful in our witness, to declare the truth over and over again. When the judgment did come, Jeremiah responded with great sorrow and compassion, right? He didn't, he didn't revel in this, right? Jeremiah wasn't happy that this judgment came. In fact, it broke his heart. That's the whole purpose of the book of Lamentations. He could have said, see, I told you so, right? We may have done that, right? We want revenge. We kind of want to get our way at times, but Jeremiah didn't have that attitude. He said, Look at what God has done. He used that word, woe. Alas, how? How? How did this happen? Number 18, lamentation describes the anguish over God's judgment. They were judged for unrepentant sins. That's why this happened. They wouldn't turn their face back to God. Lamentations concentrates on the bitter suffering and heartbreak that was felt over Jerusalem's devastation. And then that devastation, just for some background for you, is recorded in four separate accounts throughout the Bible. Second Kings speaks of it, Jeremiah uh, 39 and 52, and then Second Chronicles speaks of that destruction as well. Number 19, God judges Judah's sin throughout this book. We see that over and over. Did, are those verses listed there for you or just that statement? Yes. All right. I'll just read a couple for you. Now, the first chapter, verse 5, her adversaries are the chief, her enemies prosper, for the Lord hath afflicted her. There's that judgment. For the multitude of her transgressions, her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Verse 8, Jer Jerusalem hath grievously sinned, therefore Therefore she is removed, all that honored her despise her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backward. We see this judgment coming upon them. Uh, verse 20 of the same chapter, 
Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled, abhorred the sword, bereaveth at whom there is as death. So God judges Judah's sin. Number 20 through 22, these are right together. Hope is found in God's compassion. Hope is found in God's compassion. God is great in his faithfulness. Take your Bible to chapter 3. We'll read these verses here. Chapter 3, verse 22. Actually, we'll go back to verse 20. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I recall in my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Look at verse 25. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, for the soul that seeketh him. Think about what that statement is like. Here in the midst of all this destruction, if you will, this despair, he says, listen, our hope is still in the Lord. God didn't fully destroy us. That's what's being stated. God didn't totally wipe us off the map. He's showed us compassion. His mercies are new. His greatest thy faithfulness. We sing these songs all the time. He says, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. What do we learn from that? Listen, we go through trials and testing and times of tribulation. We ought to have this attitude, right? That in essence, we, we would put it this way. It could be a lot worse, couldn't it? And it's not because of God's love, because of God's mercy, because of his faithfulness, because of his compassion, And then God is great, number 22, in his consolation. We see him giving comfort even in this book. Turn over to chapter 5. We'll see that comfort. The last four verses, 19 through 22, chapter 5, verse 19. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. In other words, no matter what happens, God is in control. Nothing will change that fact. Verse 20, wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned, renew our days as of old. But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. But notice what he says there. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned, renew our days as of old. I was reading through that. And I thought, you know, we quote all kinds of other scriptures for our country. I don't think I've ever heard that one quoted for our country, right? We talk about, you know, doing right and having God turning his face back toward us. But boy, that should be a prayer of us. God, turn us again toward you. We shall be turned, renew our days as of old. Get us back to, Lord, our biblical principles. Guide us in those things. We see God's, in this verses, we see his faithfulness, his consolation, his word mercies were mentioned, his compassion, his faithfulness, compassion again is mentioned, mercy is mentioned. We see that as a character of who God is. Jeremiah prays to God for relief in chapter 1, chapter 3. Number 23, the prophetic focus is ultimately on Christ. Jeremiah's tears for the city in chapter 3 can be compared with Christ's tears for the city. Right There's really a picture of this. I want to read you these scriptures out of the New Testament. If you want to turn there, you can. But it gives us an idea here. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, just a couple verses, and then we'll read a chapter out of Luke as well. But Matthew 23, verse 37 says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou hast killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent out unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered through chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, for I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now look at Luke chapter 19, verse 41. And when he was come near, this is Christ, when Christ was become near, he beheld a city 
and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes, for the day shall come upon thee, and thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. We see these tears of Jeremiah compared to Christ's tears for the city as well, for these sinful people. But there's good news to all of that. Revelation chapter 21, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall be any more pain for the former things that are passed away. They used to read this over and over again in the synagogue. They still do. Around mid-July and August, it's tradition for the Jews to read out of this book. You have your outline there, my wife prepared for you. That's just for your reference. But we'll conclude with these thoughts. And we mentioned the first two already, where sin carries heavy consequences. We see that in this city. We see that with Jerusalem, with Judah, with God's people. Then we must see that sin carries heavy consequences and that God's ways are always the best way. And then lastly tonight, pray that God would cause us to lament the sin in our lives and in our society. And that ought to be a focus for us. Now we get mad. We get angry about what's happening. And we rightly should. Right? God hates sin. We, we ought to hate it as well. But are we lamenting over what's happening? You know, if all of a sudden our top political leaders got their judgment, would we wring our hands and say, oh, see, told you so? Or would we lament, like Jeremiah, would we not want to see that come to be? You know, where's our heart in all of this? I tell you all the time, we, we, and I think we do this well at our church, we need to preach the truth and teach the truth in love. Right? We can declare biblical truth very soundly. We can still do it in love. We can still show the gospel to the needy, to those that need Christ. We can still look at our country and not have a thought of, you know, there's a day coming of judgment, although that day may come and we may see it in our time, if you will. But boy, we ought to be lamenting. Whoa, how have we come to this? As Jeremiah would say. Right, if he was here today, how, Lord, has this country came to this place? How, Lord, have we turned our eyes from the fundamentals of what we were built on? How are all of this wickedness taking place? Alas, these things are happening in our country today. Let's be faithful. Let's be a witness. Listen, these things happen. These sinful things happen around us. Let's tell others about Christ. We can debate why they happen and how they happen, we know it's a result of sin. Let's tell, give people the truth. Right? Let's not skirt around the issues. Someone asks you, why do these people shoot other people? Tell them it's because of sin. But yet, there's someone who can wash all of that sin away. Someone says, how come our country's in the state it's in? Say, well, because they turned its back on the biblical principles it was found upon and showed them in the word of God some areas where we've turned our back and not following after him, right? They need to hear the truth and they need to hear it over and over again. Imagine you and I as believers that are grounded in our faith, we hear so much of the garbage all the time. Imagine what lost people are hearing, Right? That's what they're hearing 99% of their life. If anyone steps out and tells them the truth, it must be us. Let's be like Jeremiah. We learned a lot from him these last couple weeks. Let's be faithful. No one turns, no one responds. That's okay. That's in God's hands. But we're going to do what's right. We're not going to have an attitude of when judgment comes to say, see, I told you so. But Lord God, you're still long-suffering. You could still do a work. Let's pray for all of our leaders, as angry at times as we may be, and I was too last night, like many of you were. But God's still in control. God can change hearts. That's what this country needs. Let's be that light.
Lord, we love you. Thank you for this challenge tonight, for your word of God. And Lord, as we just look at these books, to learn from them, to glean from them, to get an idea of how you use these men, Lord, in, in just miraculous ways. But what they were all about, Lord, how they felt, how they thought, Lord, just the compassion they had, but yet willing to stand and just preach the truth and love, declare it, Lord, just unashamedly. And I pray we would do the same. Lord, help us to think your way, to believe your way, to truly commit to our hearts that your way is always right. Lord, give us the same passion of Jeremiah. Help us, Lord, truly to lament the state of where we are as a country, as a nation that's seemed to turn its back on you and the truth. But yet God use us to be that light in this world of darkness. Help us to have the compassion to see hearts truly changed. Lord, saved, brought in, Lord, to your family. Help our church to do that as well, to be a light to this community. And Lord, as we help support missions across the world, to, Lord, see these come to Christ as a result as well. Be with each one tonight. Keep them safe as they go home. Lord, we're looking forward to the weekend with Memorial Day. And Lord, just reflecting on the freedoms we have because of those that have given their lives for this country. And I pray as we gather with family and friends, we just have a wonderful time. Even Sunday as we gather, Lord, we just pray you'd have your blessing upon us. Be with those that are traveling. Keep them safe, Lord. And then be with our service as well. Just be honoring and be a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. We pray these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight. Have a wonderful night.